material. So we're going to do just 10 minute Q&A. If you have a question you'd love to ask, we'd love to do that. If you don't, we'll just jump into planning. So I guess if anybody has a, I know it's a smart group, but yeah. Um, in your chapel conversation, you talked a lot about the, the fact that so many people are moving into the city, uh, but you also referenced the, the suburb. And, um, and I agree with you that the suburb is generally uh, a place where people want to go away so that they don't have to deal with the problems. Um, but I don't foresee the typical American suburb disintegrating anytime soon. Uh, so how do you mobilize people in the suburbs to have a heart for the global city? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, there are some really good models that are emerging. Uh, you know, one of, the, one of the realities, at least in the American context, that we're really seeing as a profound issue is what we call the Samaritan factor. The Samaritan factor is that, especially for those of us that are Anglo, uh, is the fact that we are living near people that are geographically close but culturally distant. That is a huge issue. And part of what needs to happen in the urban, suburban context is there has to be a bridge that gets built, a bridge of trust. And one of the, one of the, the core, core realities is that uh, we believe that people can only love that which they know. So part of the assignment of the suburban church is to, and this is not easy, but is to really study the broader urban context to, to get to know people uh, in diverse ethnic and economic communities and to begin to build some of those relationships and partnerships. We're dialoguing in Dallas, for example, with some high level African American leaders and we're looking at the demographic reality that in the southern sector of Dallas, which is, 40, which is 4, 450,000 people, the percentage of children now living in single parent homes is 97%. And the reality of that, there's two realities. One is that the average leader in the average church has absolutely no idea what's going on in their own city. So there is a huge educational curve that churches need to learn in every major metropolitan area. Secondly, is there has, there has to be vehicles by which people can come together to begin to build trust. In Dallas, for example, we now have 450 agencies that are collaborating with one another across racial lines, organizational lines. Some of that was already happening, but when we did our event in January, that began to accelerate leaders working together because we realized the needs are way too enormous for any one church or institution or organization. So it's about it's education, relationship building, and ultimately trust building across these lines and figuring out ways to effectively engage. I'll just illustrate. Uh, there's a predominantly Anglo church in Dallas. Matt Chandler's the pastor. He's a little bit of a rock star. Uh, but they have fully funded five staff to go live in the southern sector of Dallas. And they now have 1,000 mentors for African-American children in the public school system. And what we're trying to do is say, this is a model. Let's find 10 other churches that can do the same thing based on what they've learned. And that will grow the impact of that from uh, from 1,000 to 10,000. So what we're trying to do is scale big ideas because the needs are so extraordinary. That's a great question. Where will it be held at in New York City? Uh, the Marriott Marquis, 45th and Broadway. Uh, next year, we will be in, back at the Hilton Hotel. And in 2016, we'll be at the Javits Center, which is the largest venue outside of, Penn, outside of Madison Square Garden. Yep. Why, Any other questions? Uh, that's a great question. Well, first of all, because we're there. Uh, we're, we're raising all the money, doing all the work. Uh, the other reason is that New York is the most traveled to city in the world. Uh, you know, I, I, it's, it's, a, it's a little humorous, but people will get on an airplane in Australia to come hear Tim Keller. It's just the dynamic of it. And Tim's been very gracious. He speaks for us every year. Uh, but we also bring in uh, very diverse leaders from different communities that come and, and be a part of that. We'll take one more question. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested. In, uh, talk to me a little bit about movement and the collaboration with the uh, civic social leaders. Yeah. I mean, we're doing this is a big work, and yeah. how are we integrating civic and social leaders in that, even some that aren't Christian? How sure. are we communicating that? Yeah, that's a great idea. Uh, let me just, a couple working definitions of movement. Uh, 
We believe that there is a movement when one of three things are happening. Uh, when the Christian population is growing faster than the general population. So there's an acceleration of numbers. Second expression of movement is when Christians are finding themselves in places of influence within the culture. Uh, the three arenas of culture that we talk about are morals, aesthetics, and knowledge. And in New York, our assessment has been that the faith community has really been, even though we have some numeric strength in parts of New York with the church, we are on the bottom rung of influence. We don't have anybody in the boardroom at Columbia University. We don't have anybody in the boardroom at Wall, at the Wall Street Journal. We don't have anybody in the boardroom at NBC. Those are places where we need to see Christians that are maturing in their faith and aspiring professionally to get into those places of position. A third definition of movement is when we're making measurable progress against the greatest social needs uh, within a city. In the city of Austin, for example, uh, the Department of Education de declared third grade reading scores unsolvable. And third grade reading scores are the biggest social indicator of how many people will find work, how many will graduate from high school and college, and how many people will end up in prison. So when the city of Austin declared third grade reading scores to be unsolvable, that's a big deal. The churches of Austin were able to sufficiently mobilize, so they've been able to adopt every third grade reading class in the city of Austin. What that means, the, third, the reason third grade is so important, grades one through three, you learn how to read, so grades four through 12, you read to learn. If you've never learned how to read, you'll really never be able to read to learn. And that, that is perhaps the greatest point of entry for the faith community to work in the civic space. Uh, there are three areas where we're seeing what I call movements impacting the social structure of cities. One is churches adopting public schools. Portland, that's where they work with the mayor of Portland, who is the first openly gay mayor in the country. And he Portland, embraced the church. Portland, Maine, or Portland, Portland, Oregon. Portland, Oregon, sorry. Portland, Oregon. Sorry, sorry. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so in Portland, Oregon, the, the faith community went to the mayor and said, how, how can we contribute to the city? What can we do to bring about the common good of the city? And he said, our schools are in trouble. Can you help us? So they have close to 300 church school partnerships in the city of Portland now. Another area is the arena of foster care. Uh, the churches in Phoenix are, sufficient, are getting organized to the point where they may, they may be able to adopt every child in the foster care system. Uh, a third area is in the area of sex trafficking. Uh, sex trafficking is a huge issue. Uh, in the U.S., I saw a data a couple, year, a couple years ago, there are about 300 young women involved in sex trafficking in the U.S., and there are only what they call 30 safe houses in the U.S., at least this was true two years ago, which are places where women that are trying to come out of sex tra trafficking have an opportunity to go. And that's an area where a lot of movements are beginning to take shape and work on these issues. And to your, to your question about uh, working with civic leaders, uh, we're finding a great receptivity from mayors in cities because churches, churches are really uh, the greatest volunteer pool in New York. The church community delivers a billion dollars of gift and kind to the city every year through volunteerism. David Brooks, I just heard this this morning from uh, Doug Birdsall, who some of you know. David Brooks is a Jewish guy who writes for the New York Times, says that, says that evangelical Christians are, the, are our country's greatest cultural resource. And this is really where we want to see the convergence of our faith and our, our, our commitment to incarnate the gospel in our cities come to life. What we're going to do now, you're going to get to help design the future. This is really, this is really how we do Movement Day. We, we basically pose a couple questions, and then we, we want you to talk around your tables, and then we want you to help us design the future. Let me just say a couple words about Movement Day. What we do now is a one-day gathering. It's a it's meeting in the morning, we hear vision casting, and then we meet in the afternoon by areas of passion. It might be church planning, it might be university work, it might be working with the homeless, whatever your passion is. And we bring people together to really ask three questions. Where are we today? Where do we want to go five years from now? And how do we get there? So the desire is to put strategies and efforts together that, that will advance the needle in our respective cities. 
2016 is going to be a little different. It's going to be a three-day gathering. It's going to be in New York. Our vision is to have 5,000 leaders from 75 global cities come together. It's never happened before, as far as we know. And the reason it's so important, it's, it's so important that we understand what God is doing around the world, uh, particularly in big cities, because it will influence how we think and how we, we move going ahead. We're very interested in having the theological seminary community involved in this discussion. Every great spiritual movement in the last 20, 2,000 years has been started by people under 28. So spiritual movements are usually birthed in the hearts of younger leaders. So that's why this is a very important discussion. We also want to have, as David said, kind of a thousand in the broader millennial kind of room or in the, in the, in the, in the conversation. So this is, this is what I want us to do around our tables. I want you to envision yourself coming to New York in two years. It's October 11 to 13, 2016, in the Javits Center. There's going to be 5,000 leaders from 75 major cities around the world. And I want you to think about two questions around your table. Does every, question, does every table have a, a, every table needs a facilitator. People will, anybody want to facilitate your table? I need a facilitator. We can appoint you if we need to. <laughs> and then uh, every table needs a scribe. Every, every, is, is there someone who can take notes at every table? We have a scriber. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you 20 minutes to talk at your tables about two questions. And then at the end of the 20 minutes, I need you to come back with two recommendations, one for each question. And you're going to report that back to the whole group. We're going to do that very quickly. We're going to go around the room. And then we're going to be done uh, before 1.30. So here are the two questions that I want you to talk about at your table. Again, imagine yourself, you're in this gathering. Uh, it's, it's, it's kind of like an Urbana for adults, if you've been to Urbana. Uh, <clears throat> here's what's helpful for us to understand. As you think at it as a seminary student, if you're a millennial, in order for this to really have the greatest impact, what do you need to learn? What do you need to learn as a result of that three-day investment? We want to invite seminaries like Gordon-Conwell and Trinity Seminary and uh, Senver and Den Denver and Fuller. We want to invite seminaries to consider designing a course around this and doing reading and coming. And, and, uh, so anyway, what do you need to learn to make this a really valuable experience for you to justify an investment of three days? The second question is, uh, while you're there for three days, what do you need to do? Or what do you need to see while you're there? This is not just about sitting in a room and talking about ideas. We're, we're very much about it being consultative, about seeing things, about doing site visits, about getting experiences. Like, for example, we'll probably take the marketplace track down to Wall Street. We want to take them down and see what's happening down there. We want to take the art track to some of the, some of the museums on Fifth Avenue. Uh, there, we're going to take people on site visits to see church plants around New York. So this is going to be a highly interactive experience. So the second question is, what do you need to experience or do while you're in these three days together? So if I can have your attention, we're going to go ahead and start. Uh, the way we're going to do this, I'm going to have Esther's table start first. And each, there's eight tables. Each table will give our two recommendations. We have a, we have a scribe for this. Who's writing all this down? Okay, perfect. All right, here you go, Esther. Esther, Esther no, Rob, Esther's going to model how to do this perfectly. I don't know about modeling, but we had some great ideas here. So first, okay, the two recommendations, but it's also focused on um, the idea that 5,000 leaders from across the nation and perhaps the globe will be there. So um, what we're thinking is creating a database of the churches. Some of the data points would be to, um, to really know about the financial resources of the church and how are they giving and how are they using the funds for the work of different ministries and which what kind of programs they have and so the ministry information and also what are some of the lessons that have been learned through that and so from that we would create then create a blog that um, all of the different churches Dallas Denver New York um, where have you can tap into and sort of learn from well Dallas can learn from Denver this is working here and, and, and then um, the second recommendation is to uh, write up something um, accessible to those leaders uh, about the big pictures. So in sum, having a few people go through and so what is it that we learned? What is the big picture? What does it look like? And so. Okay, 
So uh, for the first, oh, stay. <laughs> all right, own it. All right, my name is Tom, and uh, to the first question, uh, two things that we felt like uh, were important that we need to learn was um, how do we mobilize the whole community and not just Christian churches and, and Christian individuals, but also organizations that are secular and uh, like government officials. How do we mobilize together and deal with kind of the tensions too? But um, we, we'd just like to know how do you do that and some principles of it um, because that can be difficult, but that's one of the most important things is we all need to be on the same page and make a great impact. So how do you mobilize? And then after mobilizing, uh, we would like to hear, I think what I was hearing was like, we'd like to hear some practical ways that we're, that we're like some practical things that we're going to do now that we have mobilized. Um, uh, yeah, how, where are we going to put our energy? Um, what are some very specific things that we can do? Um, like, what are resources um, that we have, and how can we use those resources in the best way? So just very practical things. Um, and then to the second question, um, think something that we felt like was important is that we need to be exposed to different cultures. Um, and Because in, this, in a city, you have a bunch of different things going on. I think you talked about earlier where... I mean, we're so close geographically, but so distant culturally. And so just to have speakers who are very different from everyone else there, that's kind of funny because, <laughs> yes, yeah. Um, oh, hello, I'm Tiffany Ling. I'm also from New York City. Um, so it was nice to hear a speaker from there. Um, our two recommendations, we were kind of all over the place with the diversity of people. Um, so we sort of summed it up as I think it would be good to understand case studies of successful churches with different types of resources. If they have less resources or more resources, how do they use that to successfully connect with a different context, including socioeconomic and ethnic differences? So we did talk about like with the Hispanic church or with the millionaires of Wall Street, how do we connect them with the church and how do we minister to them? Um, and our other recommendation was we should go to those churches that are successfully doing it. So I think field trips, um, and it was talk about not just the worship service, but the programs that they do between Sundays uh, and connecting the community. That's it. So I'm Bert. And we said that we did have millennials here. So <laughs> but, uh, no, but we said that what millennials need to learn and see from something like this is that both that you can have an impact right now, you can make a difference right now, you don't have to wait um, you know, to get older or have other things happen. And so in both what you're hearing and what you're seeing, there needs to be that. But there also needs to be on the flip side the fact that, um, that there is very much that's ordinary about what goes on with all of this. And conferences like this and meetings and what you see tends to emphasize the extraordinary and the flashy and the, oh, wow, and you get all jazzed up and you can come away not appreciating that you just have to grind it out and gut it out a lot of the time. And even when you go someplace and see this ministry and what's happening, you hear all the exciting stuff, but you don't see the very ordinariness of what's happening. And I think millennials can get caught up in this idea. Everything has to be fantastic and it has to be spectacular and it has to be extraordinary. And then you get disappointed when you're involved in ministry or outreach and it's not that way. And so that needs to be, without you know, dampening people's hopes, you need to, and enthusiasm, you need to see that it's not all fireworks and rainbows and lightning and excitement. There's a lot of very ordinary life to what goes on. My name is Isaac. I don't know which one to pick. We <clears throat> I don't know the two to pick out of the many things we talk about. <laughs> well, we'd like to see um, how the church can engage the people that are considered like church taboo. We talk about the prostitute, the gay community. Maybe if there can be a session at that time to really, and then for people who have worked with such community to come up and speak so that uh, there can be a kind of a networking. And then we would like to see um, how church can engage multiculturally, especially with um, 
community that they are not really used to reaching out to, like the Muslim community, the Buddhist, the Hindu, you know, and uh, people to get up, those who have been working in that community, and how there can be some networking. There are many other things, but you said only two, so I just... Uh, my name is Eugene Lee. Uh, I'm from New York City. Uh, so our group, the thing that we felt was still continually lacking is probably very something basic to address is discipleship. We feel that that's something that hasn't been carried out well. And our two suggestions probably would be to have um, a roundtable discuss how that is, why that's not done or have a discipleship material presented that can help um, pastors really make that part of their church ministry because I think a lot of it is not being transferred to like older pastors to younger pastors as well. That's something pretty lacking, we feel. Hello, my name is Stephen. Uh, the first recommendation was that at the 5,000 people who gather be well, well represent the great diversity of the cities in attendance of the people from around the world. And in terms of what needs to be learned before and what needs to be experienced while in the meeting, there's a tremendous amount of overlap. Um, what do we need to see? We need to experience the problems, smell them, see them, taste them in their context, and then find out what God is already doing in unique ways. And then with those, those observed solutions, figure out how to internalize it in your own context and implement. Hi, my name is Richard. Um, we focused a lot on um, diversity. Uh, and so things that we'd like to learn would be how to contextualize the gospel in different cultures and different spheres, and that's uh, across ethnic boundaries and, and whatnot. Um, but also how, in light of all that, how do we meet physical and spiritual needs, both in, I guess, New York and also in whatever context people might be coming from, like certain areas where... Um, People can't proclaim their faith openly. Now, how do you apply these things there? Uh, practically, what we wanted to, to do, um, have conversation between people of different backgrounds, different uh, backgrounds of study, different seminary, um, and learning how to use social media and different uh, unconventional ways of ministering. Let me just make a couple of summary thoughts on all this. Uh, if, if you're interested in taking this conversation to the next step, I'd l I would like to make a couple of suggestions. For any of you, if your schedules do allow, uh, join us in New York in two weeks uh, for Movement Day. It's on movementday.com. And as was mentioned this morning, there is a student rate. That would give you a chance to really experience it. We'd love to have some Gordon Conwell students be spokespersons to the rest of the campus in terms of what's happening. And then secondly, if you're interested in being part of a future design or steering group for what may emerge in Boston, can they contact you? Uh, contact David. Uh, what we hope will happen over the next probably year or so is there's, there's three groups that have a lot of influence I, I observe in this region. There is the seminary, there is Greater Things for Greater Boston, which is a church network, and then there's the Emanuel Gospel Center, which has a really robust network. If those three things came together, I think you could have a several hundred leader gathering just in Greater Boston. That would be quite significant. Uh, so, does everybody know your email? <laughs> yeah. So that would be great. And for just ongoing conversation, social media, uh, our website, uh, movementday.com, uh, would love if you're if you're on Twitter, Facebook, anything that you gain from just what we talked about this week would be great. We'd love to get that out. Uh, in that that universe as well, uh, you're you know you're a big part of the future as students and are going to be working in strategic places over the next decade. So we'd love to have you involved, engaged, and as we formulate more specifically uh, what we're going to do in 2016, we'd very much love to have a strong representation from the seminary as it works out.